you. Thanks for being here, everyone. I am excited to see you all here and welcome you for a very special evening. My name is Dr. Carrie Cisna, and I'm the executive director at the Interfaith Center here at Miami University. We have a special program. We're so excited to welcome you all. And I'm going to start by introducing you to one of our interns at the Interfaith Center. Um, owner has actually been an intern with us for a few months now, and he is a business major at Miami University. This is a special event for him because he's originally from Turkey, he has family there, and so um, he's very motivated to bring awareness to what's happening in Turkey, and I would just like to pass it over to you, Owner, to introduce our speaker and kick off our event for the evening. Yeah, well, hello everyone, I'm Owner. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I'd like to take this time to thank the folks at the Interfaith Center, Carrie and the board for allowing us to put on this amazing program tonight. And I'd also like to thank Zainip for taking her time out of her busy schedule to come and share this amazing topic with us. And just for a little introduction, um, Zainip is originally from Turkey. She has her bachelor's in political science and international relations and was working for 33 years with Procter & Gamble. And last year after retiring, she decided to take a course through Anadolu University in Turkey over cultural heritage. And after visiting the topic for today's discussion, Gebekli Tepe, she realized and saw how um, Gebekli Tepe was a milestone in um, the formation for um, religion and civilization as we know it. So Zeynep, thank you so much for coming again. How are you today? Doing great. So excited. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so why don't we um, start off, um, we can start off with um, the presentation or we can also briefly discuss the, um, the, don't, the fundraiser that we're also holding for Earth for the relief effort in Earth in Turkey for the past yeah. earthquake. Yes, I would like. Well, thank, thanks for the introduction, first of, of all, course. and thank you, Kerry and Interfaith Center for this program, uh, and especially thank you for sharing the links for donation for the earthquake relief in Turkey. For those of you who doesn't know, maybe haven't heard of it, there's been a very strong series of earthquakes in Turkey in the last two weeks. Uh, the first one, 7.8 and then 7.6, and just two days ago, another 6.4, and it was devastating. Just, just to give you an idea, um, just imagine Cincinnati being the epicenter, and imagine Dayton, Columbus, Indianapolis, Louisville, Lexington has all extensive damage. So it impacted like over 13 million people. People either lost their uh, loved ones or their houses, their businesses. So millions and millions of people expected to relocate. So it's a huge uh, crisis, honestly. So. Um, Actually, I always do these talks for free, but this time I say, well, it's for a good cause, so why not share some links for donation if people feel like, uh, like it? Or actually, there are different things you can do. You can just say a prayer because so many people are suffering right now. Um, you can make some product donations to Matthew 25. If you live in Cincinnati, they're collecting some donations. You can donate something to your favorite organization, or I have uh, also shared, it's in the email, actually. Uh, an organization that I trust is called Bridge to Turkey, and they are a US-based nonprofit organization. It's tax deductible, so you can also donate to them. So um, yeah, so that was for the earthquake. And guess what? Actually, it was very timely because Göbekli Tepe, what we will be talking about tonight, is in this earthquake region. It's very close, um, and but the good news is it has not been impacted, so there is no damage to Göbekli Tepe. So that's that's good news. 
So um, let me first tell you what uh, what is this was about Kovekitepe, right? Uh, because it, it's been really popular. And if there is one archaeological ex excavation that changed the history, Göbekli Tepe is one of them. So it's a 12,000 year old ancient cult center. And the discovery of Göbekli Tepe really changed the history as we know it. It changed uh, our understanding of evolution of human uh, civilization and evolution of fate. So uh, and when I say that, when I say change the history, I'm not really exaggerating. So, so what was the story, right? And what did Gobekli Tepe change? So let's first talk about it. And then I have a presentation. I have a lot of pictures that I'm going to share with you. So we're talking about 12,000 years ago. So this is the uh, what is called Neolithic time, right? So the story was that uh, what we thought, humans discovered agriculture around 10,000 years ago, and uh, or 10,000 BC, and then they settled down, right? And up to that point, they didn't have uh, a faith or a religion, but them living together uh, as a civilization, and also that they were more dependent to the forces of nature, like the sun, the rain, for the agriculture, they started this belief system or systems. So that was really the story, and it makes sense, right? But guess what? Göbekli Tepe has changed this understanding. So why or how? Well, when they erected these megaliths, and they are 20 feet high and 16 tons in weight. First of all, they were still hunter-gatherers. They did not discover the agriculture yet. They didn't discover the wheel or they didn't discover the pottery. So what we're talking about technically is a pre-pottery uh, age, right? And yet they have built these mega structures and changed the history. Uh, well, first of all, it's a sanctuary, it's a cult center. And how do we know that? Well, because there is no settlement there, right? So we can tell that it is made for a special ritualistic purpose. Now, we don't exactly know what the rituals were, but we know that it was for that purpose because they, they couldn't find any uh, in human settlements. They just find a few uh, very, very recently, but it's not like to, uh, for the whole uh, hundreds of people to, to inhabit in that area. So uh, let me share my, uh, my screen. Okay, can you see it? Okay, all right. So let's talk about uh, where is Gerbekli Tepe? What is it, right? Um, and I'm gonna build it like a picture how it was to live uh, 12,000 years ago. Uh, where they lived, what they ate, what was the art look like, um, what was their uh, fate, and some of the rituals, as much as we can tell. So, first of all, Gobekli Tepe is in southeast Turkey, very close to a city called Şanlı Urfa, and in short, we say it Urfa. Um, it's a major city, and it's a very old ancient city. So they even think that Abraham was born there uh, in, a, in a cave, actually. So the city itself has a very, very old and long history. And you can feel the energy there. Honestly, it's very, very um, sacred city. And Gobekli Tepe is like only 15 miles 
uh, east of Shanurfa. It's only like an uh, hour and 15 minutes, 20 minutes uh, ride is airplane, of course, from Istanbul. And there are flights from major cities like Istanbul, Ankara, to Urfa. Uh, and then Gobekli Tepe is like 10, 15 minutes ride from this major city. And Gobekli Tepe is in, a, an, in an area called Mesopotamia. You see these two rivers. Uh, well, those two rivers are Tigris and Euphrates. They emerge in Turkey and they flow, flow through Syria and Iraq. And the area between these two rivers uh, is called Mesopotamia. So it means between the rivers. So actually, Göbekli Tepe is on the northern part of uh, what is called Mesopotamia. This, this whole area is also called the Fertile Crescent. And uh, the, the, why is it called the Fertile Crescent? Well, actually, let's go back uh, to 10,000 BC. We're talking about end of the Ice Age, right? So the, most of Europe, was really covered with ice sheets, right? It was the ice age. And most of uh, Northern Anatolia was really a swamp. But what you see here is in green and it's the uh, Fertile Crescent was actually had the perfect living conditions at that time. The climate was warmer. It was, uh, you know, uh, full of forests, fertile lands, animals, so uh, that's why it's not a surprise to see lots of ancient civilizations actually in this area, all the way from, uh, you might have heard Jericho, which is a very old civilization, uh, 14, 15,000 uh, BC. And in, uh, in the Turkish side, uh, you see a lot of different, uh, Höyük is like a mound. Um, and in Southeast Turkey, Actually, there are now 12 different sites discovered since the discovery of Göbekli Tepe, which was in 1994, uh, and it is called the Stone Hills or Stone Mounds. So there are similar sites in, uh, in Southeast Turkey. So just to give you a an idea where we are in the history, because as you know, the history starts with the invention of writing and the Sumerians invited the writing uh, 3200 BC, right? So that's where we say the history starts. And after that point on, you know, <laughs> you know our history. Before that, uh, up to 10,000 BC, it was, it's called the Neolithic age. And Neolithic age is divided into, uh, with or without pottery, uh, pre-pottery or with pottery, Neolithic A and B. And uh, actually these dates, our uh, findings change every day. Like we say, okay, 2.5 million years ago, first human species, uh, you know, arise. But, you know, that date is now over 3 million years. Uh, just recently, actually, they find evidence in, in Africa uh, for some stone tools that dates back to 3 uh, million years. So that pushed the history of humans uh, way before, actually. So, uh, and as you know, the first humans called homo hominids, and they started in East Africa, and um, 1.5 million years ago, Homo erectus, which is the first humankind that was able to stand up uh, in his two feet, uh, left Africa and spread to uh, Middle East, Europe, and Asia. And they discovered the fire a million years. So these are really the milestones and the agriculture, 10,000 BC. And uh, so you might, probably everybody has uh, an idea when I say, well, Gurbekli Tepe is really old. What they say, well, there is Stone Age, but Stone Age is really uh, 6,000 years younger than 
Göbekli Tepe. So it is around 3000 BC and the pyramids, which are very ancient, is 7000 years younger than Göbekli Tepe. So we're talking about prehistory, we're talking about the Neolithic times here, about um, for these structures, for these megaliths. I really want to, you know, take a moment to pay tribute to uh, Klaus Schmidt. If it wouldn't be him, we wouldn't be here today to, to talk about Göbekli Tepe. He is the German archaeologist who discovered Göbekli Tepe in 1994, and the excavation started in 95. And he uh, lived there uh, with actually his wife is a uh, is an archaeologist too. So they have a they had a home in Urfa. Unfortunately, he died um, unexpectedly in 2014, and now there is another team uh, took over the excavations and they're still working on it. But um, thank you to Klaus Schmidt uh, for his diligent work over over 20 years. And what really uh, made Göbekli Tepe very popular is an article in National Geographic. Let me see if you can see this. I have a copy of this magazine. So this was uh, 2011, June of 2011, and you might see the birth of religion. So this really what made uh, Göbekli Tepe very popular. And at that point, the uh, excavations was going on for a while. So before I go further into Göbekli Tepe, I just want to take you to this journey uh, of what it looked like uh, 10,000 BC, where they lived, how they lived, what they ate, who were these people, right? So we know they probably came all the way from Africa. They took this journey. Um, so in terms of housing on the Top left corner is what you see is a very, uh, the oldest living structure of the people in Mesopotamia. So this, they first dig a hole, literally. Uh, sometimes they use stones around it, sometimes just mud. And then they cover the top with wood and uh, other maybe plants uh, to have, so that they have a roof. So, um, and this one, what you see is there are some compartments. I have seen ones without even having, having any compartments. And typically a size of uh, a hunter-gatherer population, uh, a group of hunter-gatherers were like 18, 20 people lived uh, in these housings. What you see in the middle is actually again from Turkey. It's Çatalhöyük. It's one of the oldest uh, housing, uh, Neolithic age housing in Turkey. It's not the oldest in the world because of course there's Jericho uh, further south. But in Turkey, this uh, structure is uh, 7,000 BC. So it's 9,000 years old. And the housing, now you see separate houses. And I'm actually, I'm gonna share, I'm gonna show you uh, inside of a house as well. Um, they're like beehives. There is no, there are no streets. There is no door to these houses. They get in from the roof. So they have a, an opening in the roof and they use a ladder. And the fire pit is just under that hole so that the smoke can get out. So that is their way of protecting themselves from Again, remember, there were saber-toothed uh, tigers back then. And, um, and it's well pre preserved, actually. If you go to Çatalhöyük, um, it is amazing. So what they ate uh, was wheat. And I, and I said, yeah, they didn't discover agriculture, but that doesn't mean that they were hungry. Actually, they ate... Um, the, the wheat was plenty in Göbekli Tepe. And uh, so they were just gathering the wheat. It's just they didn't know how to uh, plant it, um, and which they discovered right around this time. But they weren't hungry. They had plenty of food 
wheat. They use stone tools, uh, of course, flint stones, uh, their burial practices, and again, is really important for Gobekli Tepe because we believe, or most scientists believe that Gobekli Tepe specifically is a cult center related to death or passage to death and ancestor worship. And uh, in Çatalhöyük, actually what they did was to separate the head from the body and they kept the head of the deceased person, deceased ancestor in the house. And there is a tomb uh, within, the, within the living uh, structure so um, they believed that the soul was in the in the head, so they kind of uh, kept it with themselves as a uh, reverence to their ancestors. Also, uh, this this picture is from uh, again from Chatalayuk. Uh, most of the scenes, artwork was really hunting scenes. Uh, they really thought the, the world was magical, actually. Um, and their artwork, now the scientists say that very interestingly, was a kind of a magic because they believe that if you paint the hunting scene, then you will have a successful hunting. So they believed in imagination and bringing into the, in, in the art form, will help to really achieve it, which is amazing because we're just discovering this, right? We are making like dream boards. We're cutting pictures of what we like, a house, a car, etc., And then we make the intention and guess what? <laughs> they knew it back then. So, uh, so this is a picture of uh, one of the model homes. So this is like Homerama Neolithic age in Çatalhöyük. Um, as you see the wall paintings. Now, this I wanted to share specifically because you see there is no head. So the head has been severed, kept. And the bird, typically an eagle or a vulture, is taking the deceased up to the heavens. And you see this image multiple times uh, in this area and um, probably earlier examples is in Gobekli Tepe. So, okay, let's, let's get to Gobekli Tepe. Uh, there are four enclosures, megaliths, in the form of rings. Well, actually, this is just the top of the iceberg because uh, the subsurface uh, x-rays show that there are actually twin structures deeper down below. Uh, so this is only four of them excavated at this point. So typically this is a top to down picture. There are two T-shaped pillars in the center surrounded with 12 pillars around. And I'll show some other uh, I'll, actually, I'll show a lot of pictures so you can see. So this is one view. They built this uh, protection roof, protective roof recently, like three years ago, I think, three, four years ago, um, just to protect it from uh, the rain, the snow, environmental factors. So you see these four enclosures side by side. What is interesting is they used Gobekli Tepe for about 800 years and they built one uh, enclosure and then after a while they closed it down, they built another one on top of each other. So there are four different layers and there are some pictures that you can see the layering. See, there is the top ones and then you see the angle and down bottom ones. And even there are further layers down below that has not been excavated yet. 
by the way, I'm just going with the presentation right now, but I'll take questions at the very end. So if you have questions, you can write in chat or just keep them um, at the end. So just another picture showing the megaliths. See, they so this these support mechanisms are of course uh, recent, done by the archaeologists to make sure that. T-shaped pillars stay intact. Here is another picture. Now I want to take your attention to the floor. As you see, it is very, very smooth. Well, this is waterproof flooring. This was probably the best technology, the most advanced technology they had back then. Um, they learned or discovered to burn lime and uh, make this, uh, which is called uh, pyrotechnic, which that uh, is waterproof. Well, then that brings the question, why did they need a waterproof floor? So there are questions if they used uh, any liquids during their rituals, we don't know, of course. But that is one of the questions, if they used any liquids, and if so, was it water? Was it blood? Were they sacrifices? That we don't know. But we also know they brewed beer uh, then. Yes, 10,000 BC, and they were uh, brewing beer. Um, this picture is from the, uh, actually, National Geographic, a depiction of how they might have built it. Um, this is another very interesting fact, because I told you that the typical group is 18, 20 people. To build some place like Göbekli Tepe, they needed hundreds, hundreds of people. So um, they're thinking that different tribes from the area came together to build these megaliths. So, um, and by the way, there is no water in the in the field. But well, they have cisterns, so they've been gathering rain um, rainwater. But still, they have to bring their water, most probably their food. So it was a lot of organization. It was a complex work. Just imagine. Even today, when we do like a simple uh, house improvement, home improvement project, like a kitchen renovation or something in the backyard, right? What we first have is like an intention, right? That we need to do something, we want to do something. And then there is like a discussion process with our spouse, what it or how it should look like. Then we need to find the right people that can make it. We need to select the material, uh, or maybe different people who are capable of doing the electrical work, uh, construction work, etc. So back then, honestly, that is another surprise for scientists. We didn't think humans were able to handle such a complex job like building Göbekli Tepe, but they did. So that's another fact that changed the history of human evolution. Actually, they were capable of building these structures, and let alone not only building, but organizing around it. So they had a they had a vision, they had an intention. They brought the people together around the same intent, and then they must have gone through a process to decide what and how to build it. So you might be thinking what language they were talking. We have no idea, we have no clue, but most probably they were talking and they were communicating and they had an agreement process. This also brought up something else because uh, up to uh, this point, we always thought that Neolithic people or societies or tribes, I should say, were more equal, right? Everyone, everyone was equal. Their whole purpose was really find food and survive. But to build a structure like this, you need some kind of hierarchy. You need leadership. You need different craftsmen. 
uh, you need to organize people. So that brings lots of questions uh, about the capability of humans, um, Neolithic, Neolithic people. So let's look at close up um, what is in these pillars, right? Because there are carvings, carvings, there are a lot of animal carvings. This one, what you see is a 3D. So it is carved out of the pillar, a um, like a salamander looking um, animal creature. Actually, there are so many animals at the Urfa uh, Archaeology Museum. They have a section called Neolithic Zoo. So they, it's really cute. They have a lot of these uh, animal sculptures in this indoor zoo. So this is a lion and a fox. And all the animals depicted in carvings are male and they're all fierce, like it's they're going to attack to you and they're all facing the entrance. So they think these carvings are to scare people off. Um, let's take a look at more animal sculptures or carvings, lots of them. And probably the uh, animal that has the highest uh, number we can see in Gobekli Tepe are snakes. So there are, these are snake heads, and I think there is a goat here, but most of the um, pillars has snakes. Some are simple, some are complex like this one. I think there are like 40 different animals depicted in this one single carving. But there is one pillar, it's called number 43 of the enclosure D. And they say, this is the Rosetta Stone of, um, of Gobekli Tepe. And there's a lot of different theories about this. Um, the scientific theory, I will share that first. And um, I will also try to mention that when there is a theory and it's not scientific, I will mention that. So there, there are a lot actually. Um, well, I can tell you that most archeologists agree the whole structure, Gobekli Tepe complex, uh, is related somehow to death, transition to death, and ancestor reverence. So here, at the bottom of the pillar, there is a person without a head. And remember the pictures we have seen in the previous uh, picture slide, for Chataluk with the vulture, headless humans. So here's probably one of the earlier examples. And on top of the pillar, there is this vulture like, maybe let me show it from here, this vulture or eagle like bird with open wings holding something. So, uh, and they think this is the soul that the bird is taking um, up, up to heavens. Well, uh, there is one interesting theory that I'm gonna share, and it is um, a theory by Michael uh, Swetman and uh, Dimitrios Secretis. Actually, uh, it is a paper from University of Edinburgh, published by University of Edinburgh. If you go type Gobekli Tepe and Edinburgh, this will come up. So this is called Decoding Gobekli Tepe with Archaeoastronomy. So what they did was they said, what if these animals represent constellations, right? And this pillar, is a date stamp. So there is a computer software called Stellar, Stellara, Stel, Stellarium. So what you can do with this software is load the constellations and you can tell when these constellations could be seen at Gobekli Tepe. 
So they plugged in these constellations, what they thought these animals represent of, and um, they come up with a date actually. So that date is 11,960 BC. If you were in Göbekli Tepe, and if you would look up to the sky, you would see these constellations. So it's just, you know, amazing. And that uh, kind of also ties to a theory that uh, actually there was a meteor hit uh, the Earth around that time, uh, 11,900 BC. And remember, this is not when they built the Göbekli Tepe, at least the level that we know of. This is a thousand year older. But these people think that Göbekli Tepe people knew about this disaster and they built this stone to commemorate that, uh, that disaster. Well, it's a little bit, honestly, if you ask me, um, stretching theory, it's interesting for sure. So I will let you read the paper and decide yourself, but archeologists do not really agree, but they still leave a door open. Is it possible? Yes. It could be, but we really don't, we really don't know. It seems like little force fitting. Still, uh, it, actually dismayed to the, some of the uh, media and that these uh, carvings confirm that there was a um, meteor hit earth and that this was a um, date stamp for that. Okay, back to Gebekli Tepe. Another interesting part is uh, a place called Temple E. So we have seen Temple A, B, C, D, and these pillars. Now this is outdoors. Uh, well, everything is outdoors, I guess. But this is at the entrance of uh, Göbekli Tepe. You see these two holes, man-made holes, and then these small ones. Um, when I was there first time, it was uh, winter and so it was filled up with water. So my first reaction was, well, could it be that they were using this place as an observatory, maybe to uh, observe the stars, planets, and uh, well, of course we will never know, but it's just interesting why they might have built something like this. And behind here, which I'll show a closer look up, there is a, again, human made large circle and a smaller circle inside. Again, we don't know the function, but this might have meant something for them. All right, uh, I'll go a little fast. Um, you see this tree on top of the hill. This is a very old picture of Gobekli Tepe probably 10, 15 years old. Well, uh, I mentioned that every animal was male. So there is really all male energy. There was just one um, woman sculpture or a carving, I should say, a birthing woman. So, um, but this tree on top of the hill has been used by the residents for years, for hundreds of years as a wishing tree. So the local people, specifically women who couldn't uh, conceive, who couldn't get uh, pregnant, would come and tie a thread to this wishing tree. And guess what? We have a lot of stories that they would get pregnant. And it is really interesting to have this carving of a birthing woman, of course, when these local people came to this wishing tree, they had no idea. There was like something like Göbekli Tepe underneath. They didn't know. This is way before Göbekli Tepe was, uh, was discovered. Again, some very complex uh, 3D um, sculptures. This one on the left is from Nevalichori, which is another um, area. But actually this is the first place where uh, Klaus Schmidt has worked for years. Now, within the Urfa Museum, they built an interior mini Göbekli Tepe. So if you go there, you see the exact pillars, carvings. You can come close and look up 
to the pillars closely because when the, in the real place you see the walkway but you're not a, a, allowed to go in and you see these different symbols there are a lot of work scholarly work going on to interpret these um, symbols and some linkage to Central Asia, actually, a lot of work going on. Another interesting thing, again, snakes, but you see the hole within this uh, stone pillar. So they think this is a portal to the other realms. And this is very similar to uh, what you might see in Peru, in other shamanic uh, world today that they have similar structures, but this is probably, if not oldest, one of the oldest uh, of this concept. And we see these holes in some of the pillars, plus this limestone ring that resembles that portal. Again, that makes us think uh, this might be related to death and transition to the other realms after, after death. Now, uh, this one of the animals looks like a bird that only and only lives in Australia. And there is this interesting Australia connection with Göbekli Tepe. Now, in one of the pillars on the left side, you see those two, lit of course, they are not letter C, but they look like a C and a uh, line in between. Now, this is 10,000 years ago, this picture of an Australian Aboriginal is taken in 1920. Uh, this is some people, again, this is not a scientific idea or theory, but they think that um, there was a continent called Mu in the Pacific Ocean that sank um, and people escaped. Some went to Australia, and some went to Asia and eventually came to Gobekli Tepe. So that is the explanation how they might have the same symbol. Of course, we will never know. But interestingly, uh, again, this on the left uh, bottom is a sign, an art, stone art from Australia, a similar symbol. This symbol here is from Hittai. So this is, um, late Bronze Age, or actually Iron Age. So this is late Hittite uh, empire. And this symbol means God. So this is the page from the uh, dictionary. It's the actually local Luvian language. And very interestingly, the university that I'm attending this program right now, it's a two year uh, associate degree program uh, in cultural heritage has a very similar symbol. And I was like, I really jumped up when I saw this. Uh, and I did ask this to my one of my professors in re religion and mythology, and she did investigate for me. And she said, no, this is really, uh, the, the concept behind the symbol was uh, the flow of knowledge. But still, it's very, very similar. And I think it really lives in our blood, so. All right. Some other theories. This is not from Göbekli Tepe, but this sculpture is found in Urfa and it is um, the oldest human sized sculpture in the world. This is 10,000 years old. And what you notice is there is the eyes actually made out of obsidian stone. The, the ears, the nose, this handsome guy, well shaven. He has something like a V neck um, and his fingers, but he doesn't have a mouth. So they think this might be in a temple and that he is there to remind people to keep the secrets. And I'm sharing this because we know that there people didn't live in Gobekli Tepe, they used it as a ritual area. So they might have been living close to Urfa, which is only 15 miles. And this is what is found uh, in Urfa, which is very like the fans fingers, very similar to what we see in, uh, in Gobekli Tepe. 
And also uh, because of this male dominated uh, presence in Göbekli Tepe and this V shape, again, this is, again, we, we can never prove this, but some people argue that actually this was the start of the Freemasons and later Illuminati, etc. So there is all kinds of theories. Um, even if not true, it's just entertaining for sure. But just wanted to share that. Now, this is scientific. Um, this is what is found by our Israeli archaeologists, and that the center points of the um, three uh, enclosures make a perfect triangle. So that doesn't, this also proves that not only they were capable, intelligent, but they also knew uh, geometry. Now back to the uh, stone number 43, there are those three top, and this is called the handbags. So of course, they are not handbags, right? There, there was no handbag back then. And uh, the scientific view is that these uh, most probably, we can not tell, but most probably representing solstices and equinoxes. So this was one, and then these were the other three uh, solstices and an equinox. Uh, but you see the same bags in Sumerians, and this is Mayan art. Very similar handbags. Which is very interesting. I'll speak to Karan Tepe really quick. This is close to Göbekli Tepe, another 10, 15 miles away. This is another ritual area, and they think that this was a ritual area for a rite of passage uh, to manhood. So these are phalluses, and there are 13 of them. There is this, uh, let me, let's take a close look, a face carved from the bedrock with a neck in the form of a snake. So this is another um, sculpture found in Karahan Tepe, same terrazzo floor. Um, and we are sure that there was some water involved in this particular ritual site. And that uh, the, there are two sections of this structure. And the water actually, um, you cannot see it in this picture, but it's flowing from one section to the other. Of course, we don't know if it is water, it, it, but some kind of a liquid. Okay, so let, let's, let's wrap it up. Um, if anything, I would really like you to take away that this site really changed the human history. Um, now we know that they had a belief system, they had fate, some rituals way before they settled down and they discovered agriculture. So faith comes first and then settlements. The second point, our ancestors were more capable, complex, intelligent. They were astronomers. They knew geometry um, and also association with death and ancestor reverence. That is one thing that most scientists agree about this um, cult center because of a couple of things. Again, let me wrap this up. Uh, the use of stone, because the stone is, has a, uh, gives us the image of permanence, right? So um, even today, with our deceased ones. We use a gravestone, right? So that comes way back uh, from ancient times. And also the enclosures are circles. So their idea of the world was cyclical. There wasn't a beginning and an end, just like we do have right now, because now we know too much, I think. We know that the whole universe started with a big bang. And in most religions, there is the idea of an apocalypse. But for them, everything was magical. Everything was cyclical. Um, and they believe that everything has a mana, a, a spirit, and that their ancestors didn't die. Actually, their ancestors lived in another realm. That's why they kept skull 
And they did find three such skulls in Göbekli Tepe, uh, two male and a female. And those skulls are processed, meaning there are some carvings, there are some holes in those skulls. And they think that actually they used to hang those skulls uh, for, again, ritualistic purposes. So, and the fun thing is this ancestor reverence is observed even today in a lot of religions. In Shintoism, if you go to Japan, a lot of houses has a small uh, section with the pictures of our of their uh, ancestors. In Turkey, uh, in Middle East, we do have a lot of traditions still continue for ancestor uh, reverence. So again, also some symbols live up to today. So thank you so much. I think that's all I'm going to share. Um, let me um, stop sharing this and let me take your questions. I see. Um, oh, OK, those are the links. Thank you for that. OK, any questions? I left 10 minutes for questions. It looks like Alexandra has her hand up. So if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to speak on this history. It was so interesting and I was just very excited to learn all about it. But um, I'm wondering if um, these individuals, these communities, the way they associated um, death with so many sacred elements and um, associated death with heavens and different aspects of their faith. Was there a similar association to birth as well? And what, were there areas, um, like special areas and sacred areas um, for women to give birth? Because I know there was the one um, sculpture of women giving birth, but how did they view birth and how did that associate itself within their faith? Mm -hmm. um, so we don't know if there was a special area or if the women were taken care of, but for sure they were taken care of, right? Otherwise they couldn't survive. And the fact that one of the carvings is about a birthing woman also is an indication, at least for me, that it was an important part of their, uh, of their life. And um, yeah, so, Unfortunately, there are a lot of things that we don't know and we can't tell, but um, just the fact that they had one carving and also uh, not, not specifically birth, but they had, um, they like to give emphasis to, to, to the sexual organs. You have seen the phalluses and same similar um, sculptures, mini sculptures have exaggerated sexual organs. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Any other questions? There is a question in the chat from Vera. Can you see it, Zainab? It says, are the markers, Katalayuk and GT, the first evidence of humans conceptualizing spirit slash soul? Hmm. I don't think we can ever say it is the first, right? Because uh, history goes back to art cave 30,000 years ago in Europe. There are a lot of uh, symbols that still waits to be discovered there. And history in Central Asia, actually a lot of people doing scholarly work. So these people wrote, uh, books about these symbols. So there is a lot of discussion going on and hopefully hopefully one day we'll connect all the dots and we'll know more about them. It's definitely very intriguing. Any other questions? I have one. Can you hear me? Karen? Yes. Um, I, you you referred to the civilizations that are um, credited with with building these 
structures that go back, let's say, 10,000, 12,000 years as uh, hunter gatherers. But I'm confused. How could they be hunter gatherers if they actually built these bases? And wouldn't they have, um, without some sort of agricultural knowledge, wouldn't they have depleted the resources within a radius around, around these bases if they were inhabited for hundreds of years? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a great question. So how do we know they didn't discover the agriculture yet? Because um, the the science improved so much that just looking at the seeds they find in Gobekli Tepe, they can tell if they, those were cultivated or wild uh, wheat, and they can tell that it is it is the wild wheat, wild kind. So that comes back to your question, they needed a lot of resources, right? They needed to find their food every single day because they don't have agriculture yet. So this actually gives even more um, to how they organized to build this complex structure and all, they, they consumed all their uh, resources and effort. So there might be some other people providing them food like I said, there was even no water in Göbekli Tepe. They had to bring water. The closest water source is three miles away. Well, also, do we do we have any any knowledge or uh, evidence that they were in contact with other civilizations in a trade relationship? I wonder. Yeah, see that we don't know, but probably this project. So they treat this as a project, Stone Hills. And I attended a two and a half hour uh, Zoom talk of all the head archaeologists of these 12 different sites. So they're talking to each other, they're sharing their knowledge. Hopefully we'll connect the dots at some point. So yes, but to answer your question, they don't think that this was one tribe. They think that, they even think each of the pillar or each one of the 12 pillars represent maybe one tribe so maybe those animals were their symbols of those tribes but one thing they are pretty much sure they came together to build this together and maybe they they weren't using their intellectual knowledge like we think of technology they were into spirit more than you know the wheel maybe I, you know, uh, that's a good point. I'm I'm pretty sure they were more connected than we are. They observed yeah. nature right. way more than we are. They looked up the sky. We don't anymore. That's a that's a fascinating takeaway from all this. Yeah. yeah. We need to get back, back back to the garden. Yeah. Hi, I have a question. So uh, the, you mentioned uh, the aborigines of Australia and how the, some of those symbols are the same with the people in this tepee. So um, we know from DNA testing, it's been established conclusively that the aborigine population originated in Africa. We know that. In fact, National Geographic has done a lot of research and uh, published a lot of papers on that. So does that mean that the people who lived in southern Turkey back 12,000 years ago also originated from the same population and they had the same symbols and same culture, if you will, as those who migrated to Australia many years ago, 12,000 years ago? It could well be because otherwise, how can you explain <laughs> Right. Right. It's the same symbol. It is, yeah, 10,000 yeah. years away from each other, but it's just amazing. And there is, I think there is no other explanation. It just comes from the same place. Same place, same population. This is my Hi. husband, Zain. I, I, yes, I, I recognize Bala. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for joining. Zeynep, so we got 
uh, in the chat here from Greg asking, are there any ideas about how the use of the site ended? Okay, so that's a great question because um, first they said they buried it and left, right? And then question is, and now archeologists actually uh, debate if it was just covered by nature or if it was really deliberately buried, but the fact that it was deliberately buried was accepted for a long time, like first 20 years. But regardless, why did they leave? It could be an environmental reason that they depleted the resources and they had to move uh, or a war or something, a natural disaster. And then what I've read is because this place was sacred, uh, obviously, and was for their ancestors. And because they couldn't their, take their ancestors with them, they buried them. So that made sense to me. But guess what? We will never know. Any other questions? Last one, maybe, because we are running out of time. Well, if there's no other questions, um, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with before we wrap up? Yes. So uh, I think that really, um, for me, gave a whole understanding or appreciation of our ancestors that have capable, organized, smart, intelligent, resourceful, they were, right? So that is my way of uh, ancestral reverence by bringing this out to pay my respect to these ancient people because they're kind of bringing what their life looked like to us and there is so much we can learn from them how we can peacefully different tribes come together and build something together And thank you so much again for this opportunity. Thank, thank you, Zeynep. Thank um, you, Honor. Of thank course. Um, it was a really great conversation to have, just an insight into all of this history that you talked about. Um, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to share this with us. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you. All right, thank well. You, thank you. It was great. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. So Thank you, everyone. everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you, Zainab. Yes. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Zainab. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night. And Thank you, owner, so much for helping moderate and introducing the speaker. Yeah, of course. It was my pleasure. Thanks, owner. Do you have any feedback, anything for me or? Um, no, that was, it was fantastic. It was great. Thank you. Good. Thanks yeah. again. Yeah, I of recommend course. you keep doing this, keep spreading the word because this is amazing. And you can tell this was a great turnout. And I think, yeah, it's wonderful to hear your message. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Have a good, good night. night. Thanks. Good night.